We're excited that you are here. I'm excited to be home. As this is a place that has been home for my family for many, many years. As this was a place where I got a lot of trouble. I saw Brother Bill Simone, Mom. I saw Bill Simone. I said, what's up, Commander? <laughs> Back in Royal Ranger days. He said, you remember me? I said, of course. He said, I didn't think you remembered anything I said. I said, well, I'm a slow learner. I'm so excited about being able to share this morning and uh, in the series of, of Romans we're looking at today. But one of the things I, I'm really excited about is this is a place where I found Jesus. This is home. Uh, right here, April 18th, 1999. After years of addictions and struggles, and emotional, mental battles, everything that I faced right there, April 18th, 1999, gave my life to the Lord. And this is the place where I found my calling. I didn't just find Jesus, I found my calling here. Preached some of my first sermons here. I apologize for all of them. <laughs> and this is a place that helped my wife and I start our church in Minneapolis. And I want to say thank you for being a kingdom builder. We're doing all that you guys have done to help us be a part of what God's doing globally. But just last week alone, I'll share just a few things with you. Just last week alone, we baptized 53 people in water. Come on. 53. What's amazing about that story is 43 of them registered. That means 10 of them were like, I've got to get into this water. They're taking out their cell phones, their wallets. They're like, let's do this thing. And I'm super excited. So 53 total. And for the last six months, we've been tracking this. For the last six months, our goal is we want to reach unchurched people. I'm not looking for transfer growth. I don't care that you didn't like the carpet of your last church or you didn't like the music minister or you didn't like the pastor Doug didn't wear socks. I don't care. I want like people who are coming off the streets, need Jesus in their heart and in their life. And so for the last six months, we've seen 187 people give their life to Jesus for the first time. You're a part of that. That's what you have been part of. And I want to say I'm so thankful for what God has done. And it's all started right here in this church. It's everything that I learned right here. And I'm so thankful. Well, today we're going to look at Romans chapter 5. As we do, I want to lead you in this moment to help you understand Romans chapter 5. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church and he's helping them understand that when we go through battles and difficulties in our life, that they actually, as followers of Christ, they work for us, not against us. And so we're going to look in that. As we do, I want to introduce my wife over here. She's not a standard. They're from Minnesota. They don't do that stuff. They're like... That's about it. But I have my son. He'll stand. He's single, 14, looking for a lady, anything. <laughs> single, ready to mingle. So line up, ladies. Line up. He is an amazing young man. Been married. We just celebrated 18 years of marriage. Come on. My wife said it's been the best eight years of her life. <laughs> Come on. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 5. How do we face these battles and trials? Let me read the scripture. I'll pray. Romans 5, he says this, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, with peace, through God and Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Here it is. Because we, as followers of Christ, we know, we know, Know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces godly character in our life, and character develops hope. And verse 5 says this, and hope will not put us to shame. Father, I pray that over each and every one of us, that as we learn to walk through and navigate difficult times, battles, struggles, tribulations, and trials in our life, that we would walk out of there stronger than we came into it, that we would find hope that is attached to our future, because your word says in Jeremiah 29, 11, that you know the plans you have for us, declares the Lord, plans to prosper us, not to harm us, to give us a hope and a future. So Father, I declare that over this place, that we would walk out of here stronger than we walked in here before that no matter what we're facing no matter what trials no matter what struggles we would see thy kingdom come 
and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. And the church said, amen. amen. Come on, let's give Jesus one more hand clap of praise. The apostle Paul says that we can gain this, this hope in our life. Now, if I was to talk about hope, hope comes from this place of suffering. If I was to talk about hope and, 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 and our future, because our hope is always attached to our future. And nobody hopes for their past. I hope my past is doing okay back there. We have a hope for our future. So hope and our future is always tied together. If I was to preach about hope and future, man, many of you would be like, this is amazing. This is exciting. Like, let's talk about hope. Let's talk about our future. Let's talk about that, John. But then understand, in order to have that, if you work it in reverse, that hope begins to come from this godly character that we develop. Godly character is developed when we learn how to persevere. It's something that our culture and society has not learned how to do is persevere through difficult times. I had a Nigerian driver this morning from, from the great company of Uber, and he was, he was telling me, well, I wasn't planning on going to church. I didn't know I was driving somebody to church, and he was like, I just wasn't planning. I was like, well, let's get the sermon in now, and the reverse offering, I think it is. <laughs> I preached and gave. All right, here we go. And I gave it to him, and he was like, and he begins to tell me in his accent about how in Nigeria, they learned how to persevere. But in America, we've forgotten how to persevere through trials and tribulations. That we oftentimes actually take steps back rather than taking steps forward. And I'm like, you better preach right now because that's going in my sermon. Oh, I started writing in, the, in his Jeep. I'm like, that's a good line. But here's what we learn is if we work it in reverse, then all of a sudden, in order to have hope for our future, we've got to walk through some difficult times in our life. But we know, Paul says this, but we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, character, hope. And I know some of you are like, man, like, Pastor, could you be a little bit more positive in, in this? Oh, I am positive. Here, I'm positive you're going to face some battles in your life. I'm positive on that. Why? Because Jesus said it in John 16, uh, 33. He says, in this world, you will have trouble. You'll have tribulations. You'll have trials. You'll have battles in your life. But then he says this word, take heart. I've overcome the world. That's difficult to understand when you are walking through a battle. God, I'm glad you overcame the world. I'm glad you overcame death, hell, and the grave. I'm trying to figure out how to overcome cancer. I'm trying to figure out how to battle through difficulties, through a marriage issue, through kids and, and grandkids. I'm trying to figure out how to do all this. I'm glad you did that, but I'm not you. You ever been there? Because life is full of setbacks. Life is full of problems. Life is full of loss. And we face those challenges in our life. How do we go through the setbacks? How do we go through that? Paul says that we've got to learn how to persevere. Jesus says you're going to have them, but watch this because there's a clue. He says, I've overcome the world. In other words, your setback is a setup for a comeback. Because you cannot have a comeback without a setback. You cannot have a miracle without a problem. Do you know the main ingredient for a miracle is a problem? Some of you with problems, you're like, I just got problems. You are set up for a miracle. You're divinely set up. Nobody ever says, I need a miracle. Why? What's wrong? Nothing. <laughs> I'm good. Like, I need a miracle. Why? And here's a list of problems. So if you have problems, you're divinely set up. And then there's loss in our life. You cannot have a resurrection without a death. And there are some things that may have died along the way in your life, but God says, I can resurrect those things in your life. I can resurrect the dreams. I can resurrect the calling. I can resurrect the vision for your life. I can resurrect the dead marriage in your life. I can resurrect the prodigal sons in your life and the daughters in your life. I can resurrect those things. So you are divinely set up for we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, character, hope. How do we navigate through this? Here's something that I've learned about myself over the last few years through good help of counseling, is that I am a strategic person. My counselor looked at me, he said, John, do you know that you're strategic? I'm like, I am? He goes, yeah, you, the way that you think, you're very strategic. And so for the last year, I've been looking at my wife, I'm like, babe, I'm strategic. And she's like, okay. I'm like, I got strategy. That's how I got you, strategically. 
strategy, but I also catch patterns. And I want to show you a pattern and a strategy that I find in Scripture. When you are facing a battle, how do we overcome them? How do we walk out of there with hope? Let me show you a strategy that I find in King David's life in 2 Samuel. If you have your Bibles, you can open them up to 2 Samuel chapter 5. If you have your iPhone, you can use that or use your eyelids. They're all going to be right there, whichever one you like. 2 Samuel, we see the strategy that David develops that we, he would walk through battle. Now, we know David as a man after God's own heart, but we also know David as a man who liked the battle. David loved the fight. David was like, let's get it on. Let's fight. You want to bring some? Let's take some. Let's go. Remember, David shows up with all the sandwiches to his brother when, they're fa- when Goliath was out there yelling, and they're facing Goliath, and they're like, let's go. And the brothers were like, David, the youngest of them all, David's like, let's go. Why are you guys intimidated by this giant? They're like, look at the size of him. And David's like, let's go fight him. And the king's like, why don't you wear my garment? He's like, I got this. And he's ready to go to town. David was not afraid to battle. David was a shepherd. And while he was out in the field shepherding, what did he face? He faced the lions and the tigers and bears. Oh, my. my. He was ready to fight. So watch this. How does David go through this? He developed a strategy that's in the scripture, and I want to show you how you can persevere through any kind of battle and struggle that you're facing. Here it is, 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 17 says this, when the Philistines heard that David was anointed king over Israel, all the Philistines went up to search for him. All the Philistines, not some of them, all of them. You ever felt like when you were facing a battle that all of hell was after you? All of the enemy was after you. He didn't hold back anything. Here's what happens. They went up to search. So they heard and they went up to search for David. But David heard of it. And he went down into the stronghold. Now the Philistines had come and spread out over the valley of Rephaim. And David inquired of the Lord. Shall I go up against the Philistines? Here's another great question to ask. You want me to take them? Yes. Will I win? That's what David's asking in this moment. Like, well, I'll go. But am I going to win? I want to know first. Yes, you're going to win. Then let's do this thing. So he goes in. He says, will you give them into my hand? And the Lord replied. I love that. David inquires of the Lord, and the Lord replied. David inquires of the Lord, and the Lord replied. Go up, for I certainly give the Philistines in your hand. And David came to baal Perazim, and David defeated them there. And he said, the Lord has broken through. That's my prayer for today, that there would be a breakthrough in your life. That no matter what battle you're facing, no matter what you're walking through, there is a breakthrough that is about to happen. He says, the Lord has broken through my enemies before me like a breaking flood. And the name of the place is called Baal Perazim, which means the God of breakthrough. Notice this. The Bible says that the enemy heard and they went up. Where's David? David's in the land of Philistines. David's in the land of giants. But here's what happened is the enemy realized that David was no longer intimidated by their size. You ever notice the enemy will always try to make himself look bigger, stronger, better? So what happens is the enemy realized that David was no longer intimidated by their size of the giants, so they went up and made themselves bigger. They wanted a vantage point against uh, against David. So the Bible says that the enemy heard and they went up but David heard and he went down check this out say this with me the enemy heard everybody say heard Heard. and the enemy went but David and he went the enemy and he they went I almost messed that one up but David and he went the enemy and they went but David and he went David goes down. There's a strategy. Understand the enemy will always try to make himself look bigger than what he really is. The enemy will always try to come around. The Bible says that the enemy roars around, prowls around like a roaring lion, like a roaring lion, which means he is not. Do you know what stops one lion dead in the tracks in the jungle? It's the roar of another lion. And there is only one lion, and that is the lion in the tribe of Judah. And when he roars, it shuts the mouth of the enemy and makes him cower down because he is not a lion. He is like a lion, and he tries to con- convince you that he is something that he is not. He is bigger than what he is, but he is not. And so now the Bible says that the enemy, and they went, but David, and he went, ooh, there's your strategy. How do I overcome? How do I persevere? Notice this. The plan of the enemy will always to go up. 
But David developed a strategy that he would go down. The enemy will always hear that you are advancing. Remember, here's what's happening is David is advancing the nation and he's restoring worship back into the nation. And the enemy hears of it and they're upset about it. And so now they're going to attack him because they do not want God to be the focus of their nation. And so the enemy hears of this and now they're going to attack. But David hears of it and he goes down. Let me just share this with you because the enemy will always know when you're trying to advance the kingdom of God in your life. When you decide, I'm going to restore worship into our home. I'm going to restore worship into our house. I'm going to restore God. I'm going to bring our family to church, even on July 4th. Come on, somebody. I, I'm just a firm believer. I'm so thankful for my mom. She played by a different set of rules. Her rules are different than the nation right now around the world. But she lived by a set of rules. If you live in my house, mm. some of y'all playing by a whole different set of rules. And that's why your kids are 40 still living in your house. Long as you in my house, you going to church, you can do what I said, you're gonna do, and I'm thankful for that. But now here we have these moments in our life where we face battle, we don't know how to persevere through them. We just, I, I'm just done. I'm just, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to handle this. I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. And the Bible says that when David was now getting ready to face another battle in his life, he hears of it and he goes down into the stronghold. You have to understand when the enemy hears that you're facing something, you're, you're advancing the kingdom, when you're, when you're beginning to say, hey, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a part of the multipliers. I'm going to start serving in our, in our church. I'm going to start helping out. I'm going to start going to multipliers class. I'm going to get connected. I'm going to start tithing. I'm going to be a kingdom builder. The enemy hears and they go up. But David, David faced a battle, and the Bible says he went down into a stronghold. Now, that word stronghold, the original language, is a sacred place where David would meet with God. It's a sacred space where David would meet with God. In my office, I have this ugly blue chair that came from my in-laws. And that's not why it's ugly. It's just ugly. <laughs> but it's an ugly blue chair, so nobody go out and buy a blue chair and be like, John said it was blue, and, and that's where God would speak to him. It was just a blue chair. And there's just a chair, it's in my office, and, but this is the place where I would read, I write, I pray. I read, I write, I pray. I sit in this blue chair, and I read, I pray, I write. That's what I do. I just, and, and that's what, it's a sacred space. There's nothing impressive about it, but it's effective. And I think what's sad is we have replaced effective for impressive. I just need to be impressed. Pastor, impress me. Pastor, impress us with your kids' ministry. Pastor, impress us with your, with your outfit and no sock. Pastor, impress us with the worship. Pastor, impress us with the carpet. Pastor, we weren't impressed by the sermon. Pastor, I wasn't impressed by the music. Pastor, I wasn't impressed by the, the, the moving over and crossing over. Pastor, I wasn't, I wasn't impressed. And here's what I would say to you about being impressed is that when you are in the midst of a battle, I'm not interested in you being impressive. I need effective. I'm not looking for you to be cute. I need you to be powerful. I need you to be able to storm the gates of hell and declare God's kingdom come. I need you to declare that cancer would be eradicated. I don't need you to look pretty with a, pet, a yellow vest. I need you to be able to get into the throne of God and declare healing would come. A breakthrough would happen. Marriages would be restored. Children would come to know Christ. I don't need you to look cute. I need you to be effective. But we've replaced effective with impressive. Impress me. I'm not impressed. And I would say, I'm not your pastor. Come back next week. You'll have a great sermon and an amazing pastor and a wonderful guy. I, I'm not interested in impressing you. I'm interested in impressing God. Yeah. Yeah. If I wasn't impressed by your message, I wasn't impressed by what you said. <laughs> well, I was offended. I'm offended that you're offended. All right, if we're going to live in that culture, let's live in that culture. I'm not interested. I want to please the Lord, and I want to be effective. The Bible says that the prayers of a righteous person, not a cute person, the prayers of a righteous are as powerful and as bold as a lion. That's what I'm looking for in the midst of a battle. I don't need all the cute stuff. I don't need all your lights and your smoke and all that. I need effectiveness. It's the marriage that's about to end. They're not looking for all the other stuff. They're looking for power. They're looking for thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And this is a moment right here. What I love is because the Bible says that David went down into the stronghold, that sacred space where he would meet with God. And now notice this because here's a strategy. The enemy, and they go, David, and he went, he went down. 
And now notice this. Here's that moment. David, the Bible says, he inquired of the Lord. David inquired of the Lord. If the last time you prayed is when you're in trouble, you're in trouble. The Bible says that he inquired of the Lord. Watch this. God, what do you want me to do? God, where do you want me to say? Where do you want me to go? God, how do you want me to do this? What does it look like? You, Lord, if you lead me, if you guide me, if you direct me, when you tell me, I will go. If you want me to go here, I'll go here. If you want me to do this, I'll go do this. And so the Bible says that in that moment, David's facing a battle, and he goes down into a stronghold, a sacred place where he meets with God, and he inquired, God, what do you want me to do? See, we've become really good at making decisions that we stop learning how to discern. And I just felt like that was something the Lord spoke to me in this moment of my life where God said, I want you to stop deciding. I want you to start discerning. Because I'm really good at deciding. I can make decisions like, let's go. Let's make decisions. We're in a building renovation, and I know where I'm wanting to do things. I want a wall over here. I want this wall over here. I want a door there. I want the door to look like this. I want this to happen. And I've gotten really good at deciding. Some of you in here, you're a great business leader, and you're good at deciding. You decide. But what God's asking you to do is discern. So you go down into the stronghold, you inquire of the Lord, and God, what would you want me to do? God, how do you want me to do this? David, David developed a strategy in persevering, and it was where he would inquire of the Lord. Remember Psalms 139? Psalms 139, many of you know this passage of Scripture. I've been quoting it wrong, but you know it. It says, search me, O God. And know my heart, right? He says this, search me and know my heart, test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive ways in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. Some of you have misquoted it and heard it misquoted. You say, search me, O God, and know my way and see if I'm offended. <laughs> Lord, just check my heart and see if I'm offended. See if anybody's offended me. See if I'm bothered by anybody. Lord, just search me and know me. But yet, what David is saying is this, search me and know me and see, watch this, See if I'm offensive. Show me the areas in my life where I'm offensive to people. And then, God, would you help me? Would you lead me? Would you guide me to everlasting? What's David doing in the stronghold? He's in a sacred place where he's now asking God, not for overcoming a battle, but for overcoming some things in his life. Search me. I need you over there, but where, what do you want to do in here? I know I need a breakthrough here, but I need you to break through here. So search me, God, and then see, see those areas. Show it to me so that I can come out of this stronger than I came into it. And that's what happened with David. David came out of the stronghold stronger. Why? Because watch this. The Bible says that David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord replied. David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord replied. David comes out of the stronghold with direction. David comes out of, the, out of the stronghold with wisdom. David comes out of the stronghold with authority. David comes out of that stronghold with versatility. And he takes back everything that the enemy was trying to steal from him. And he takes it back and he restores worship into the land. And he begins to overcome battle after battle. How? Because the Bible says that when David was going into a battle, he went into a stronghold. And when he went into the stronghold, he inquired of the Lord. And after the Lord began to replied to him he walks out of there stronger than ever before how do i persevere i got to find my stronghold i got to find my blue chair i got to get to that sacred space where god would begin to speak to me when's the last time you went into a sacred space and asked the lord to speak to you he comes out ready to battle he had direction he had confirmation he had authority he had power. You ever been in a battle before where you just didn't know what to do? You're struggling. And then all of a sudden, there's hope inside of you. Hope for your future. I'll never forget just a few years ago, both my boys were in the same accident. My oldest broke his foot. My youngest broke his femur. Without going through the drama of all of it, the femur is one of the strongest bones in the body. It tells you it was a severe accident. And I remember them walking through this and she and i we moved him with my with my in-laws an hour west of the church i'm still pastoring the church still managing the staff but now i'm here with my kids and if you've ever walked through a moment where you're watching your kids suffer that's suffering that's hard 
And so here's my, my oldest is recovering and he's doing well. And my youngest, it's a little bit longer, spent several months in a wheelchair. And I remember going back and forth and because, because there was a trust that was broken, he only trusted dad. So only dad could help him. Only dad could give him the medicine. Only dad can get him out of bed. Only dad can put him in the wheelchair. Only dad could give him his medicine. Only dad could give him a bath. Only dad could get him dressed. Only dad could take him to the hospital. Only dad could take him to his rehab center. Only dad could do that. And I got to tell you, I started to break down. And there's this moment where I'm, I'm just, I'm losing hope. I'm pastoring a church. My wife and I are battling through this with our, with our kids. And we're trying to see a healing take place. I'm hearing doctors talk about how the femur, when it broke, the bottom part went up four inches. And now they're talking about how he may need lifts in his shoe the rest of his life. And then over the course of time, he'll probably need hip surgery, multiple hip surgeries, because of how he'll walk for the rest of his life with a limp, because of an accident. And I remember my heart breaking in that moment. God, why would you do this? He's seven. He's seven. Parents ever prayed that prayer beside a hospital bed? God, break my leg. I'll take it. Heal him. And I found myself breaking down and just struggling emotionally, spiritually, fighting with everything that I can. I remember calling an overseer of our church, and I told him, I said, man, I'm really struggling. I'm doing fine on Sunday. I get up, and I preach. Come on, everybody. Let's give Jesus a hand. And I go back into my office, and I weep. I have pictures of me and my son and my wife beside me, and we're in worship, and I'm holding his hand while he's in a wheelchair. And declaring the song over him, you've got a lion inside of you, so get up. And I remember saying to him, don't get up yet. And get up and pray. Sit down and praise. I'm like, no, hold on. I remember I found myself breaking down in this board of overseer in, my, in our church. He said, John, what you need to do is you need to get away. And I said, man, I can't. I can't. I'm doing everything I can over here. We managed to have some time where I got away. I go to, I go to his church and, and I pray. And in, a, in his prayer room, it's nothing, it's nothing impressive. There's a lamp <laughs> and a love seat. And from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., I would sit and I would pray and I would pray and I would pray and I'm praying for a breakthrough in his life and God, would you heal him? And Lord, I rebuke everything that the enemy is trying to say about lifts in his shoes and about hip surgeries and knee surgeries and long-term damage. Lord, I'm just declaring there's a breakthrough in his life. I'm declaring healing. Listen, I'm not looking for impressive. I'm looking for effective And I'm praying and I'm declaring. And in that moment, God began, while I'm praying for a breakthrough, God is breaking through here. God is speaking to me about me. You see, what you don't know is in that story of the accident was my wife's father, who felt really bad. He was a part of the accident, needed counseling. But I found myself getting angry at him, resenting him hating him and God in that moment in that sacred space in that prayer room began to deal with John John I want to deal with this area in your life I want to deal with this character issue in your life I want to deal with anger inside of you and I'm praying for a healing in his life and God's doing a healing in my life but I can tell you that it was in that stronghold that God began to deal with me God began to say listen I got that little boy's life I've got him well taken care of and I got a plan for him and John he'll walk again and he'll never limp again and he'll run again and he'll be active again and he'll be just fine and you'll come out of this stronger than you went into it you'll be blessed in the end of this story and John I'm not done with his life I you will see a healing over him and I begin to walk out of that place that stronghold lamp in a love seat stronger than I came in there I begin to walk out of there knowing that God was doing a healing in my life that God was setting me free from some anger issues and healing that moment in my heart that God was saying I still got a plan for you I'm not done with you and I'm not done with your family I've got more in store for you I got a plan for your life to prosper you not to harm you but to give you a 
future and a hope that's in store. And all of a sudden, here's what I want you to know, is that church was this church. That prayer room was across the street. And that pastor was yours who said, John, you got to get away. And here's the words he said. You've got to learn how to fight through the battle of this. And this is how we fight our this battles. This. In this whole process, I realized one of the things that God began to do in my heart was I came out of there stronger. I knew God was going to be okay. God was going to give me the victory. David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord replied, I got you. You go fight this battle, and you're going to be more than an overcomer. See, it reminds me of the game of checkers. Anybody like checkers? It's easier than chess. I just found out my wife was a sixth grade checker champion. And spelling bee, she told me. She was like, don't forget spelling bee. If you're going to tell the story, tell the whole thing. Sixth grade checker champion and spelling bee. Uh. Get it, girl. I'm married up, (laughs) y'all. You know what I love about checkers? It's, it's, It's real simple. There's red pieces and black pieces. And the object of the game is to get across to the other side. And now you may lose some pieces along the way. But when you get to the other side, you get to say two words. How many know what it is? Woo! You get to look at your opponent and say two words. King, me. And what they have to do is they have to put back on you what they took off of you. And now you are able to move in any direction you want to move in. You are stronger than you were before. You are, have more versatility than you have before. And it's in that stronghold where we declare in that moment like David, God king me. Give me back everything that the enemy has tried to take from me. You put that back on me. You give me my confidence back. You put back on me my peace. You are not taking my peace. You are not taking my joy. You are not taking my family. You are not taking my kids. You put back on me everything that you took off of me. And now I'm coming out stronger than ever before. Why? Because this is how we fight our battles. Lord, in this moment, I just declare that we would be reminded of the sacred space, a stronghold, where we meet with you and we would inquire, God, what do you want me to do? And that we would come out of the stronghold stronger, that we would remind ourselves that you are with us, you'll never leave us, you'll never forsake us, that no matter what battles and strongholds we face, you are with us, you are our rod and our protector, our staff. You lead, you guide, you strengthen, you encourage, you comfort, you empower. So even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. You are with me. With heads bowed, eyes closed all across this room, those watching online today, if you are not in a right relationship with Jesus and maybe you're facing some moments in your life, Today would be a great day to say, God, would you forgive me of all my sins? Would you come into my heart? I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. And the Bible says that when we pray the prayer of repentance, he comes into our heart. He's not looking for perfection. He's looking for progress. God, forgive me. A willing and contrite heart. Forgive me and help me to live for you today, tomorrow, for the rest of my life. If you're here all across this room, head bows, eyes closed, and you're not in a right relationship with Jesus, but today, today you want to be. Today you've been trying to face your battle by yourself, and the Lord's saying, I got you. I can help you. I can lead you. Let me enter into this moment, into the space. With heads bowed, eyes closed, on the count of three, if you're not in a right relationship with Jesus, but today you want to be, would you lift up your hand on that count of three, hold it up high enough and long enough that I can see you, I'm going to include you in my closing prayer. One, two, three, lift it up. Yep, 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 yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. I'm going to ask the prayer team to come. As they come, I'm going to pray a prayer over you. And maybe you're facing a battle today. This would be a perfect moment. To say, I'm going to ask somebody to come in and just pray with me. Maybe you received Jesus today for the first time in your life. This is a moment to share with somebody. I, I'm, I received Jesus. We want to continue the conversation with you to give you the right next steps to help you grow in your faith. 
But if you're facing a battle, you are not alone. The enemy wants you to think that you're alone, and you are not alone. There are men and women who have been praying all service long for this moment right here and that there would be a breakthrough. So, Father, I just pray over each and every one of us today. Lord, you see hearts that are open to receiving you and asking you to forgive us of our sins. Lord, I pray that you would forgive us, that you would heal us, that you would set us free from addictions and strongholds and pains from our past. Lord, I pray that those who are in this moment saying, God, would you forgive me? God, you would bring forgiveness, restoration, and healing. Pray for those who are walking through a battle that today they would be more than overcomers in this life. And we declare this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope the service today made a difference in your life. And if you made a decision to follow Jesus today, we would love to know. All you have to do is download the app and click Next Steps. We have resources we'd love to give you as you begin your journey in following Him. Haley, did you know that you can get quality online education that is Christian <laughs> at SEU Carolina? Hey, if you need something to do this summer, you should start thinking about if you want to go to school or not. I don't think you even need something to do. I think let me give you something to do. Okay. You should start thinking about College. whether or not you're going to go to school. Like, what are you going to do with your life? Yeah, you probably need to do something important. You need to do something. And you might want to go to seucarolina.org mm -hmm. and see if that might be a good option Yeah, for you. you don't even have to go to the building. You can do it all online. That's right. And if you want to go to the building, you can do that too, though. Yeah. But you should go to seucarolina.org. And if you go there, you're going to get information that will change your life forever because you decided to invest in quality Christian education that makes your future better, brighter, brighter. and better. Like, and he went to college. <laughs> if you would like to make awesome mouth noises like me, <laughs> SEU might be the place for you. That's right. I so don't you have didn't an, go to SEU. No, but I, I have a music degree. And he's using it. Yeah, I yeah. am. <laughs> We're the worst sales pitch ever. <laughs>